Um, uh, when David actually invited me, I thought I should uh, speak about uh, a topic that I'm actually familiar with, of course, uh, crypto Boolean functions, but he's also interested in uh, some tools, you know, graph theory tools on uh, crypto Boolean functions. And I had some proposals a while back, and I thought I should uh, revive that a little bit, especially since one of my PhD students actually was working on this, but you know, still waiting for those major results popping out of there. Um, anyway, so I'm interested in um, uh, string ciphers like A51, by the way, this is broken, has been broken for the past 10 years or so. Um, this is used uh, in the GSMs, by the way, from 2005, this was actually um, denied to be implemented on any communication, on any smartphones um, from 2005 on. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, block ciphers, string ciphers encrypt you know, one bit at a time, block ciphers encrypt at the same time, blocks, right? So, uh, and I put up here uh, the FISO scheme and the SP and the substitution permutation network scheme that are mostly used for uh, block ciphers. Of course, just for reference purposes. My job, basically, is to look into um, what goes on in this uh, particular step. The only nonlinear feature of any block cipher and or string cipher is in the, um, in the substitution round, well, substitution actually step in every round, which is the only nonlinear feature of any block or string cipher. Okay, so we want to come up nonlinear in some, you know, um, uh, definition that I'm going to explain uh, a little uh, later. So Boolean functions are simply, or crypto Boolean functions are simply cryptographic primitives in symmetric block or string ciphers. Uh, I'm also interested in uh, public key, but that's for a different talk. Now, a couple of definitions here. It's going to be slightly m more mathematical than uh, some of the talks, but um, a couple of definitions. The Boolean function is simply a function defined on a vector space of dimension n over the binary field with values into the binary field or a vector space over the binary field. Those are called multi-vectorial Boolean functions. Um, I'm going to speak about the simplest case, well, the simpler case, the ones that are unidimensional uh, Boolean functions. Of course, they can be regarded, they can be looked at via the algebraic normal form, which is basically a polynomial, multivariate polynomials, or the truth table. That is the output of that particular function. Of course, it has to be because I'm inputting you know, n values, um, then the output has to be a vector of dimension of power of 2 to the power n, right? Um, very important notion in this, and uh, you'll see a couple of more later on, Hamming weight and Hamming distance. The Hamming weight basically looks at, regardless of what the input is, either the uh, vector or the truth table of the function, the Hamming weight is counts the number of non-zero values in the output. Really, we're looking for bits. The Hamming distance is the weight of the sum. Again, either the function or the sum of the vectors, whatever the input is. So the Hamming weight of the sum. Again, when I say sum, I actually mean the sum over the structure that I'm considering, namely the binary field. So the, the nonlinearity. Pardon me. The symmetric difference. There you go. Okay. The uh, that's right. That's actually using the classical operations addition. Now the nonlinearity has been recognized in the 70s, by the way, as a very necessary ingredient in any crypto system, in any crypto primitive. Nonlinearity could be either the algebraic degree, you know, far away from linear functions, or the nonlinearity as far as this distance is concerned. So the nonlinearity of a function is simply the minimum distance between the function and the entire set of affine functions. It's basically, you know, simply put, how many bits do I have to change into this function to change it, to replace it by a linear or affine function? How far away are you from the set of all weak function from a crypto perspective. Um, of course, it, it has been proven, by the way, that it is bounded by this bound that I have right here, 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 2 to the power n over 2 minus 1. And, uh, you know, as we've done, as we do with mathematicians, say, well, if you have a bound, you attain it. Of course, since I have an n over 2 in, in the exponent there, you realize that you can only attain it for n even. And that actually can be attained. Not only can, it is only attained for n even, um, by what we call bent functions. They were invented in the mid-60s, published in mid-70s. Uh, it was somewhat sensitive at the time. Um, again, I'll talk more often than uh, the, about anything else, actually, about bent functions, because that's actually one of uh, the things that I'm uh, very much interested in. Um, 
tools, please. Um, so is the Hamming weight, from your definition, the Hamming weight of the polynomial, the algebraic normal form, always defined to be the same as the Hamming weight of the truth table? Correct. So each monomial has to have all of those. You actually, the Hamming weight of the polynomial is not the polynomial, it's the, the output of the polynomial. It's the truth okay. table. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I mentioned that. Now, um, tools, about tools on dealing with these functions. Is it possible to compute the nonlinearity or anything else about the function or crypto properties using some tools? And a very, very important tool on, the, uh, on, on this is the walsh hamada transform, which is a discrete version of the Fourier transform. You basically express either the function, f of x, or its signature, minus 1 to the f, with respect to the orthonormal basis of the group characters, minus 1 to the power. So if you rewrite this as minus 1 to the f dot minus 1 to the ux, u dot x, those are the form, you know, uh, an orthonormal basis. Well, I actually, I kind of prefer, don't ask me why, I have no idea why I chose that way, but I kind of prefer to normalize the, uh, the, uh, the transform. The reason, well, one of the reasons actually, I said that I don't know why I chose that way, but some people actually prefer not to normalize it, they just disregard this 2 to the power minus 1 n over 2. However, when you compute the inverse of any respectable z transform, it has to be invertible, right? Otherwise, you can't use it. Um, this is invertible, and I have the same coefficient. That's actually the only reason I found for myself why I chose that way. Some people prefer not to put the minus, the, this coefficient here. Of course, this is going to change into 2 to the power minus n in there. It's just nothing changes, just a constant multiple, assuming n fixed constant multiple of the uh, of any result that you come up with. Okay, now, going further. Uh, I mentioned about band functions. They achieve that maximum nonlinearity. They are as far away from, from affine, from being linear or affine, as possible. Of course, they achieve only, they happen, that happens only for an even. It is still open, I'm not going to talk about this, but it's still open what happened for an odd. In fact, we know so little about this, we don't even know I mean, usually, you know, NIST or NSA suggests to use about 30 variables, right, in, in, in these ciphers or in, in a crypto environment. Well, we don't even know what happens for n odd if n is 11, let alone 30, 31, to be honest, right? So we know so little about this. We, in fact, we have to shrink the classes to be able to count exhaustively and see what is the maximum nonlinearity for n odd. Okay. Um, there was a conjecture that was actually open for 20 years up until 1985, and uh, it was disproved by basically presenting an example. All right, now, it ha they have many applications. In crypto, they're not used per as they are, because one, unfortunately, weakness of band functions is the fact that they are not balanced. They have a bias toward having more ones than zeros. The weight of a band function is 2 to the power n minus 1 plus or minus 2 to the power n over 2 minus 1. In other words, it was not a or the plus in the bit. So it may have more zeros or more ones. But they have many, many applications. In fact, they achieve the best you know, cross correlation like gold or Kasami codes, if you want to use it in spectrum techniques. Uh, coding theory. Unfortunately, besides Rothhaus's constructions, Dylan constructions from uh, 70s, and a few more recent one, uh, Dylan works for NSA, Daubert worked for German security agency, unfortunately he died a few years back. Huge loss, because he was actually young. And Carlet uh, from France, they have some constructions of band functions. Carlet's construction is not as constructive, if you will. Um, in other words, it's more theoretical than, um, if I ask, you know, good friend of mine, if I ask him, well, give me an example, precise example that is outside of the known class. He can give a theoretical ex example, but he cannot give it the polynomial because there's so you know theoretical results there. Now, so many problems here. One con more constructions, characterization that I can use to construct you know examples that I need to use in a crypto system, or if you give me such a polynomial or a two thing, you know, two to the power n bits, is it possible to check if I have a band function? Right, that's a good question. Well, I put it in red because whatever you see red, that means something iffy or unknown there, <laughs> right? Secret key there. Now, we need many properties for a Boolean function. Balancedness, I have to have no bias in you know, more zeros than once. 
So Panama is actually is a, an absolute mystery ingredient. DES was invent, in, invented in the mid-70s, 77. Um, all the S boxes, substitution boxes that were used in this data encryption standard were balanced. They have to be balanced. No bias there. High algebraic degree. Well, interestingly, this um, is to counter differential cryptanalysis, which was invented approximately what? 15 years after DES actually was uh, invented. Well, every S box used in DES actually is, uh, is immune against differential cryptanalysis. And that was, those were 15 years before it was invented. So people believe that they actually knew about differential cryptanalysis, but they didn't say it. Um, high nonlinearity, and I'm talking about the Hamming nonlinearity, the distance between f and the set of affine functions, to counter linear cryptanalysis. This was invented by Mitsuru Matsui. Now, high CI, correlation immunity, to counter correlation attacks, so many attacks, right? High AI, which was invented in 2002, algebraic immunity, to counter algebraic attacks. I'm actually going to speak about this to the students on Friday, because it's so, I think, easy to describe that, you know, students actually can, um, can um, pick, that, pick that up a little bit. And there are many more variations of this, SAC, PC, GAC, SAC stands for Strict Avalanche Criterion, PC Propagation Criterion, GAC stands for Global Avalanche Criterion. So there are so many things that you, one, can, one has to you know, take into account when you propose a crypto primitive. Question, can all these properties be satisfied at once? I mean, we, we have definition, we have examples of functions that satisfy every one of these that I mentioned previously. You know, how do we hide this, hide that, nothing is, uh, you know, uh, unknown. However, what about if I want to satisfy all of them at once? Unfortunately, no. Not that we cannot find it, we actually can prove that satisfying one to the maximum actually decreases, you know, the property of the other one. So you have to have a balance. I mean, do you want to have, you know, be fast or you want to have, you know, very secure? So you have to be, um, you know, quite creative and, and, and basically satisfy the best that you can do, you know. Uh, as far as the theory says. So that trade-offs. Now, um, I, I can speak about many of these things, um, uh, but um, the reason actually I want to give this talk is because I want to see if we can visualize the crypto properties of, this, of these Boolean functions. Is it possible to sort of look, represent the function, the Boolean function somewhat, somehow, and then look at that particular graph, if you will, or picture, I probably should say, and then say, well, maybe this function is not good. So is it possible to visualize? Well, there are two proposals. Uh, one is a Cated graph, and the other one is the Nagy graph. The Cated graph works for any Boolean function out there. The Nagy graph works only for homogeneous Boolean functions. The reason also people are, hey, by the way, these were invented, of course, these graphs have nothing to do initially, have nothing to do with you know, crypto. They were invented by graph theorists, of course. Um, but they are used, or they were applied in this context uh, quite, quite a bit, uh, 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 I mean, quite recently. Nagy graph works only, only for homogeneous functions. And the, the interest of people in the homogeneous functions is the fact that they, can, they are used in, um, in the hash function environment. Hash functions, you know, signatures of message digest and, and so on. So I don't want to talk about this. But the question, the, uh, the point is, um, I, I, I have to um, reuse previous computations. And, and homogeneity actually allows me to do so by rewriting the functions uh, uh, differently. Now, let's uh, take the show on the road. k graph. What is a k graph? Well, I'm not going to define it in the general context in graph theory. Rather, I'm going to say it exactly what it is for Boolean functions. So I have to give you the vertices. I have to give you the, um, the, the edges. The vertices of the Cated graph associated to a, a fixed Boolean function is, uh, has all the elements of the vector space as vertices, f to the power n. So every n tuple with binary components is a vertex in this graph. Now, what about the edges? Two such tuples, n tuples, are connected by an edge if and only if the sum of the two tuples is in the support of the function. In other words, f of the sum is equal to 1. It's an undirected graph, by the way. And speaking of which, one can 
you know, construct a cave graph that is direct, a digraph. Um, I haven't actually looked into that, but it doesn't say anything to me, especially since um, you have a double edge between two, uh, every two uh, vertices there. I can put some more constraints, but um, nothing interesting pops up, at least to me anyway. Of course, as any graph, you, uh, you look at the adjacency matrix, you look at the spectrum of the uh, adjacency matrix, sometimes it's called the spectrum of the graph. Um, one thing that I have to say is that the graph that you obtain that way is a regular graph. And the degree of every vertex is exactly the cardinality of the support of the uh, function itself. So the support I labeled that by omega f. So that's the support. That means every input, the output is to a 1. So every x for which f of x is equal to 1, that is the support of the function. It's a very important topic, by the way. So that's the weight, of course, the weight of the function. It's a regular graph. All right, well, that's fine. Let me give an example. I took randomly a function out there, x1, x2, xor, x1, x3, xor, x3. Just, again, random function on three variables. And I constructed the Kelly graph. I put on vertices every single uh, triple, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. By the way, I did it by hand, so not really pleasant. I'm not very skillfully programming, so um, I can do something, but not too much. Uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, blah, blah. So it's the regular, you know, uh, inverse electrographic ordering on z to cubed. And then, of course, uh, for instance, there is a, an edge between 0, 0, 1 and uh, 1, 1, 0, because the sum is 1, 1, 1, and f of 1, 1, 1 gives me 1. That's, it's as simple as that to construct this particular Kelly graph. All right, well, not, you know, too difficult up to this point. Now, what can I do with it? Well, for my purpose, um, the, my interest in this, actually, it's interesting how life actually takes you. Um, my interest in this came um, right after I actually knew what a strong regular graph is, and I worked on, on strong regular graphs from a graph theory perspective, nothing to do with, with crypto. Um, and you'll see what the connection, precisely what the connection is. Let me define this notion, a strong regular graph. Here's what the point of this is. I have a regular graph. This graph is strongly regular if and only if there are two parameters, fixed, E and D, such that any two adjacent vertices have the same number of neighbors, namely E, and every two non-adjacent vertices have the same number of neighbors, namely D. Fixed parameters, E and D. Okay? Now, these are random numbers. They have to satisfy some type of an equation. I also have interest in number theory. So the parameters have to satisfy a very fixed Diophantian equation. R, R minus D minus 1 is E, V minus R minus 1, V being the number of vertices. D being the, the, uh, uh, the parameter and E being the parameter for adjacent, D being the parameter for non-adjacent, non and R being the degree of the graph. Very fixed, actually, you know, equation. I mean, when you see that, you say, oh, gosh, there, there can't be that many, right? There can't be that many. I mean, it's just too much structure here. But remember that philosophical principle. I mean, if you have too much structure, or the lack of a structure is too much structure. <laughs> it's not random, right? So you have to have a balance between structure and non-structure. Well, interestingly, and I included this quote here, strong irregular graphs lie on the cusp between highly structured and non-unstructured. And he gave an example for a unique SRG, strong irregular graph, with those parameters in more than 32,000 for graphs, not isomorphic graphs, for those parameters. I mean, it's such a huge jump because it's the same number of vertices, 36, changing with the parameters, just huge difference, like chaos theory, right? Um, in the light of this, it'll be difficult to develop a theory of random struggling. This is somewhat disappointing. I mean, it's just really a little bit disappointing because you say, well, it's too much chaos there. How am I going to use this? Well, this is actually uh, the connection between strong regular or, you know, these scaling graphs and um, Boolean function or crypto Boolean functions actually came about in 99, you know, right about the time I finished my doctorate. Um, interestingly, the eigenvalues of the Kelly graph associated to a Boolean function is almost the wash hadamard uh, coefficient. This is an amazing result, I think. An amazing result because they observed it. The proof was just a, almost a triviality. 
But once you observe, I mean, of course, once you have the idea, it's a reality, but it takes a while to get the idea, right? So the eigenvalue corresponds that is almost the wash harmonic spectrum. By the way, B of I is the binary expression of I, for lack of a better way of labeling that. So B of I is the binary expression. It has to be a top, right? An end top. So uh, that was, and of course we have some more results like uh, a handle on the multiplicity of uh, some eigenvalue, right? The multiplicity of this eigenvalue or of this, of course, eigenvalue or in this case is the same. Um, is that, um, assuming gamma connector, then um, I can, sometimes I can say something about the, uh, one of the spectral coefficient, namely or eigenvalue is minus the weight of F if and only if the spectra is actually symmetric with respect to zero. So some other results, but the most intriguing one was the first one. And by the way, I also have a control, somewhat control on the rank of the matrix in terms of the degree of the polynomial regarded you know, as a Boolean function, or the degree of a similar polynomial regarded as a polynomial over the real number set. Then the operations are not necessarily XORs, regular operations. So that's also a degree, and I have a bound of the rank between these two bands. So there's some results in there, but I want to attract, I want to draw the attention to that because that's intriguing and important. Now, of course, once you have a result, you say, okay, uh, how about if I can say something about the graph or the Boolean function? If I, well, we have two ways actually. When you invent the notion, you say, okay, so what about if I weaken to death the notion and say something untrivial about that? Well, you know, whatever the notion is. Or we start with the strongest you know, condition on the, on the notion and then say, if, if we can, you know, say something on a If we can, we weaken it. If we can, we weaken it. If we can't, we, we, that's a philosophy of mathematics, right? <coughs> so in this case, we started from the smallest case. Very few eigenvalues, very few spectral coefficients say something on trivial. Actually, this was done in the context of graph theory. So I'm just borrowing from there. 65, Shrikhanda and Bahanas. That should they prove that if gamma f has two distinct eigenvalues, then its connected components are complete graphs and some other you know, group theory uh, or some other structure, algebraic structure in that. So two distinct eigenvalues, complete components, complete graph components. Now, what about three? What about three? Well, again, when I say three distinct eigenvalues, I don't mean that only three non-zero. I mean three distinct with some multiplicity, right? That's what I mean. Now, if I have a connected R regular graph that is strongly regular, that happens if and only if there are only three distinct eigenvalues. And not only that, but one of them has to be the degree of the graph, R, and the other ones actually determine, along with the degree, determine those parameters that I mentioned, E and D. So we know that, again, this was done in, group the in graph theory. And of course, I know something about the Cayley polynomial, right? The polynomial, the minimum polynomial of the matrix. Nothing to it. I mean, this is actually what was known. All right, well, let's see if we can actually be a bit more explicit on that. Well, for instance, if we have three distinct eigenvalues, again, I'm removing the two eigenvalue, distinct eigenvalue case because I am dealing with complete graphs and uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples in just a little bit, so bear with me please. Um, so three distinct eigenvalues. Let's say one of them is zero and the spectra is symmetric. One of them is lambda and the other one is minus lambda. Then gamma f is a complete bipartite graph between, only, between the support and the complement. That's intriguing. So for instance, if I see a, uh, you know, if I see a complete bipartite graph, between some set and the other set, and I know that I have only three uh, symmetric spectra, or, you know, uh, with zero in the middle, then I know that I'm dealing with a, um, well, strong irregular graph, and more than that, you'll see in a moment what I'm referring to. Now, what about if I have uh, also three distinct eigenvalues, zero is still in there, but not symmetric. You know, lambda and something else. Well, lambda one and, uh, lambda two and minus, uh, now, then gamma is actually, there is no bar in that. Gamma is the direct sum of some number of complete graphs. Again, gamma is the direct sum of some complete graphs. Okay, that still gives me something. What about if I have three distinct eigenvalues? Again, this is graph theory, nothing to do with, with Boolean functions. It's actually I don't see why the middle thing has to be an 
Correct. Oh, um... Minus R over lambda 2 plus 1. Actually, it's the uh, ceiling of that, sorry. <laughs> it's ah. the ceiling of that. Okay. It's an artifact. Um, yes, you're right. Correct. Now, um, I hope I didn't forget anything else in there as far as ceilings. Uh, I'll see. Or maybe somebody will point your attention to that. So half my talk will be wrong. <laughs> maybe not. Now, um, if you have three distinct eigenvalues, but none of which is zero, you don't have as, as, as accurate description of the graph as, as before, unfortunately. I can give you the eigenvalues, I can give the multiplicities, but uh, things, you know, strange things may happen. What about four and beyond? Four eigenvalues and beyond? I don't know. You tell me. We have no idea. Well, for specific cases, for n fixed, I can probably, I mean, I certainly can give a description, but uh, in general, it's not as easy, okay? Because many things can happen. You see, even for three cases, I have to distinguish between non-zero, symmetric, non-symmetric, and so on and so forth. And, you know, strangely may happen. Now, um, as I mentioned, for specific, specific values, we have description. And Bernasconi actually and Codenotti, Bernasconi, Anna Bernasconi is, um, wrote her PhD in 99, and uh, um, Bruno was actually the uh, PhD advisor. So um, what they, they've done actually was, okay, so I'm taking four variables. Of course, you see how difficult this can be, because I'm dealing with a double exponential you know, problem. Even for four variables, so far away from you know what I mean in practice, you know, I actually have two to the power two to the power four, which is more than sixty-five thousand, sixty-five five thirty-six different Boolean functions. Four variables. Can you imagine this? Now, even for ten variables, you have two to the power two to the power ten, which is two to the power one thousand twenty-four. That's beyond any capability. I don't care how super, what you know, big the supercomputer is. You can't do even for ten if you do it brute force. Um, even for six actually takes a little bit because it's four sixty four. And even if you go beyond that, I mean, it's, it's double exponential and the complexity can be exponential in that double exponential. Uh, in, so <laughs> it's really, you know, these are hard questions. Now, what they've done, this was known. Theoretically, it was proven that there are only uh, eight equivalent classes on the affine transformations for four variables. This was known. In fact, it was known that the representative in each class, when I say affine transformation, I actually mean input and output. So I'm replacing x by a non-singular matrix, ax plus b, and then I'm adding up some other affine function at the end, at the output. That's an affine transformation. And by the way, some of the good features, the crypto features of a, of a function are invariant on the affine transformation. For instance, bendness is invariant on the affine transformation. If you replace a, you know, a function by its, an affine equivalent, you still have the same nonlinearity. If it's bent initially, it was bent now, and so on and so forth. Many of these are actually invariant. So these are the truth table and the warp spectrum for all of these uh, you know, eight classes. Let me see exactly how the Kelly graph behaves, is, or what is, for each class. This is the first class. Completely disconnected, right? Totally disconnected. Um, it has um, only one eigenvalue, and it's totally disconnected. It's the zero function. It can't be better than that. I mean, just, um, so totally disconnected function, not interesting. You'll see all the cubes in every dimension in here, almost all dimension, up to n minus one. So this is this is a cube, by the way, in one dimension. So um, the second, uh, the, the Kata graph for the second representative has two distinct spectral coefficients. This is a pair. It's just a collection of uh, disconnected components, each of which is obviously an edge a second. Now, the third representative, a cube in two dimensions, a square. Um, it has uh, four connected components and three distinct eigenvalues, by the way, one of which is zero and symmetric. Okay? So even I, I could actually use the previous six, 1965 result to come up with that. Oh, did I skip over? No. Oh, this is the third, the fourth. This is a cube in fourth dimension. I know it's an unfortunate, actually, um, I had to have uh, some sort of a symmetric thing here, so I used the tool to, this, to, uh, to um, uh, do the picture. Um, the fourth representative has two connected components. It's a three-dimensional cube, okay? 
still three disjoint, three uh, um, eigenvalues. Four represent, fourth representative, oh, did I skip over four? The uh, fifth. The fifth representative, um, two connected components, three distinct eigenvalues, and each component is a complete bipartite ramp. We've also seen that case previously. So again, I could have actually set that from the beginning and just draw you know, a graph out there. Uh, you don't have to do any work in here because the results from the graph theory actually gives you the, uh, the right ingredient, the right uh, tool. The sixth one is a connected graph, hopefully all the edges are in there, with five distinct eigenvalues. So for this one, you really have to do the work because the theory doesn't say anything. So you have to take up the um, uh, uh, sixth representative and then compute, you know, put all the uh, 16 uh, vertices in there and compute the actual edges uh, for that. Five distinct eigenvalues. However, the most interesting, at least for me, is the seventh and eighth class. The seventh class, interestingly, after you sketch this graph, you see that it's strongly regular. It is strongly regular when the parameters E and D, I didn't actually put them down. Um, let me see if I remember them. Um, e is zero and D is one. In other words, if you give me two adjacent vertices, they have, they have no common neighbor. If you give me two non-adjacent vertices, they have one common neighbor, I hope. I know they look like, I mean, I, it's kind of hard to do by the tool that I, that I use to do round edges in there. So I sort of did a collection of segments. Now, Strong irregular, three distinct eigenvalues. No, it doesn't seem to be a pattern there, right? I mean, this is much more complicated class, by the way. It contains more functions, but it has three distinct eigenvalues. The previous one has five. So what's up with that? Now, the seventh, from a crypto perspective, this is the most interesting, not only for me, but this is the most interesting one, because this is not only strong irregular, but the parameters E and D are equal. So they said, okay, so um, not only that, but people knew from the crypto community knew that the eighth representative actually, uh, all the functions of that class are bent. They are, they have the highest nonlinearity and they're all bent. So Anna actually said, well, what happens? Why is this, you know, strong regular with D is equal to D? Well, they proved the following result. Initially, they guessed that. Um, they published the paper, but it was based upon an unsolved Diophantine equation. And Van der Kamp from Princeton actually joined, uh, joined in and actually solved that Diophantine equation. And he proved the complete equivalence. So here's the complete equivalence. A Boolean function is bent if and only if the associated Kelly graph is strongly regular with equal parameters. This is an if and only if. This was really surprising. Initially, they proved, um, uh, uh, in 1999, they proved uh, this implication. And then Van der Kamp joined in and solved that one the equation and, and proved the other implication. Of course, you know, you have an expression for the k polynomial, but that's not really that uh, complicated. Now, how we use this, and again, red, how we use this to find the bent functions, I have no idea. How can we check? Well, I have some idea. How do we check if you give me a function and I, if the associated Kelly graph, how can we check if we have a, a bendless or non-bendless? Well, it, sometimes it's easier to, to uh, show non-bendless than bendless, of course. Um, and that's uh, what I've done. Um, they, um, for instance, in the same paper, they showed uh, some of the properties of the associated Kelly graph. For instance, uh, Gamma f is bipartite if and only the complement of support contains a sub subset dimension n minus one. You know what that means? That means that these ones, for these, you know, the elements in the support of the function are somewhat uniformly distributed. That's not a good function. That means that if you give me a, a Kelly graph and it's bipartite, I'm pretty much sure that it's not good from a crypto perspective, okay? Because you have too much uniformity in the support. Um, and by the way, sometimes we don't have to prove in crypto that uh, something is bad from a crypto perspective. We just have to feel that. If you say, oh, we feel that I don't like this function. And that's fine. People actually believe me. <laughs> OK. Um, what I showed actually, it is, indeed, uh, it is indeed true that the feeling was actually right there. 
if f is bent, then the associated calligraphy is not bipartite. Okay? In fact, if gamma f is triangle free, then f is not bent. So I have a you know sort of a simple criterion for detecting non-bentness. Of course, um, the converse is not true, and I give an example here. The gamma f has plenty of triangles. I checked. It's actually it's easy to, to detect. Um, we don't, you don't have to display the entire graph, by the way. You do not have to display the entire graph. What you have to do is give me three points um, in there. I mean, given any three points, um, the, um, you don't have a triangle based on, upon those three points. In fact, you can actually prove this theoretically. This function that you see right here actually has a significance. It's the invariant under the, the cyclic group. So I knew that. <laughs> I sort of knew that it doesn't have any triangles because of a different reason, theoretical reason. Plenty of triangles, but f is not bent. Um, I show that in some other paper. Now, what about some other crypto properties? Okay, bendness is fine, but what about correlation unity? What about the SAC? What about the propagation criterion? Is it possible to detect that by looking at the graph or by, if you give me the spectrum of the function? And the answer is, well, sometimes. Uh, I mentioned here the correlation unity because there are many attacks based upon uh, 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 the lack of a correlation in function, and in fact, I even teach that in my crypto class, and I actually display precisely a combiner, and I, I can, you know, I, I have a very low complexity for guessing the right, the secret key uh, on that combiner. Um, that's the definition, and I actually showed, and of course I have many results on this, but uh, the first one actually is important. Um, oh, sorry, there's actually the second one. Uh, the second one, f is correlation mean of some order if and, only, if and only if the eigenvalues are zero for any index of weight between 1 and L. So if you order the, the eigenvalues according to the weight of the index, then I know by just looking at the spectrum if my function is correlation or not. And this is a complete description. It's an if and only if. Okay. It's not the IFF, identified for, for front, right? <laughs> okay, so now, the resiliency means, in addition to correlation unity, means balance. So, of course, I can detect that as well. And I can also look at the number of non-zero eigenvalues or zero eigenvalues and, and have some bounds for, um, for um, actually not bounds, rather an exact count for the number of zero eigenvalues. That's how many of them are there for an L correlation unit function. Of course, if I put the uh, resiliency in there, I have one more. OK, so not this again. Uh, I thought I proved this in uh, 08, but uh, David actually reminded me that I proved it in 07. Um, I forgot. It's been a little while. Many things have happened there. All right, so we can actually detect correlation unity by look, looking at the spectrum of the kilograph. What about the SAC or PC? I'll, mean, I'll mention what the, uh, oh yeah, probably I should mention. I'll mention what the uh, PC means the propagation feature. Believe it or not, this is an idea, a modern idea, on many modern ideas actually are borrowed from the crypto that happened in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century, okay? Um, I have a theory on that. Um, for instance, if you look at the Krasinski test, test for multi, multi uh, 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 for the uh, poly alphabet ciphers, you align a, a cipher with a shift of the cipher, you basically correlate the two. Well, we have a name in the modern mathematics for that, it's correlation, world correlation. We have this principle that was actually, apparently was invented in the mid-90s, but uh, people knew about it in the 70s, when they designed the ciphers that were used up until the 90s. Uh, for instance, the PC means f of w plus a shift of the input is balanced. So if I'm changing something and I shift the function, the input, not the function, if I shift the function, then there is no bias, okay? So even if you mess or you kill someone and you know say, well, okay, maybe if you change this bit, you'll have more bias towards zero, more bias toward one, nothing is gonna happen for a PC function. Now the SAC actually much more interesting, it was invented by Works and Tavares at Crypto 85. Um, I actually have a paper with Tavares on this, on SAC. Um, they actually invented this notion, beautiful notion. Said, well, maybe, maybe if you if you know that if you change, if you mess with the first bit, if you flip it, the output changes more towards having more ones or more zeros. However, if a function satisfies the SAC, changing an input bit, half the bits in the output will change, half will not change. 
like a diffusion. Shannon's diffusion, right? So a bit will not influence only the first three or the last three or the middle three or whatever. It actually have an influence in about half of them. So this is a beautiful actual principle, SAC. Changing one bit, the output changes probably one half. So Bernard's putting quadrant actually proved that you don't even have to read this. They said, well, if a lot of conditions happen, and uh, W is given by that linear system that you saw before, so many conditions that, that F satisfies the SAC with the, uh, the PC respect to that W. But that W is actually a very precise solution of some linear system. I, I, when I saw that, I said, this is ridiculous. I mean, I mean, you know, I have to be able to show that it's PC respect to any W, let alone only one solution. And uh, I came up with the following principle based upon count. It's just a simple count. So here's the principle. I'm taking n of x to be the set of neighbors of some you know, vertex in the Kelly graph. Interestingly, f satisfies the PC respect to any w if and only the symmetric difference is exactly balanced. This is a complete description. So basically, if you give me the Kelly graph and you ask me, well, is this maybe this vertex will have an influence in the input of the function. If I mess with it, maybe it will, it will change the output in some direction. And the answer is no, as long as the neighbors of the origin, zero, taking away the neighbors of w, plus the cardinality. The neighbors of w taking away the neighbors of zero is exactly 2 to the power n minus 1. So it's just a simple counting. I'm looking at the neighbors of this, the neighbors of that. Oh, OK, so the sum is, has to be exactly 2 to the power n minus 1 you know, half of the entire true thing, right? So if that happens, then my f satisfies the PC respect to w. The, uh, and of course, we have a condition. I have a condition, of, again, a complete equivalence there um, as far as the, uh, the eigenvalues, but that's, you know, rather, rather technical there. So I just put it in for completion. Nothing to it. Um, actually, I kind of like this result. I mean, it's not difficult to prove, but it gives you a complete picture of, of what happens there. Now, OK, I talked about bendness. I talked about correlation unity, uh, SAC, PC. Uh, what about the weights or nonlinearity? I haven't said anything about that. Well, here's a result that I, uh, I, I was able to uh, come up with. Not a fantastic result, but it gives me something. You'll see what I'm referring to. I'm assuming gamma f is connected. By the way, every, even if it's not connected, every com connected component is actually our whole the connected components are isomorphic. You saw that even in the example that I gave you, every connected component is the same. I'm just repeating that many times. A certain number of times. Now, and I'm assuming that I have n plus 1 distinct eigenvalues. Then I have this particular bound, n less than or equal to log base 2 of r plus r choose m. I have a proof next, but I'm probably going to skip it because, uh, you know, time constraints. Or r is the weight. So I have this particular constraint. In other words, my weight cannot be too small. It's actually given by this inequality. So if you give me n, if you give me n, and you give me that, you say, OK, so you have only seven distinct eigenvalues. Can you give me a bound on the weight? And the answer is yes. The, the answer is yes. Let me uh, skip over the proof and just give you the corollary. That's actually very important. So again, if I'm actually, if I'm dealing with three distinct eigenvalues, not only that, but it's strongly regular. Remember that strongly regular has three distinct eigenvalues. Then the weight has to be bigger than 2 to the power n over 2. The weight of the function cannot be too small for a strongly regular graph. This is a nice detection because sometimes actually, I mean, to count obviously the, the weight, you simply have to do a big O of 2 to the power n operation, the worst case anyway. It's still exponential. Um, but uh, in this case, actually, it gives me a lower bound. Maybe I'm happy with that as well. If any is sufficiently large, I'm, so, I'm, you know, I'm happy with this particular bound. It may actually be a lot bigger than that, maybe even bent, but it's a lower bound. It cannot be too small. You have some constraint. Remember the trade-off? So I like this. And in the last few minutes, and by the way, I probably will finish in the last few minutes, um, Naki graphs. I remember, when I, uh, I remember when I mentioned that uh, Nagy graphs refer to only Boolean, uh, uh, homogeneous functions. Um, on f to the power 6, there are 2 to the power 20 homogeneous Boolean functions. A lot of them. I mentioned that they are used mostly in hash functions because I can reuse. But, uh, you start to look at Haval in 95, right? Haval used the 
um, even the function that you saw previously that is inverted under the cyclic group. Um, most of which are, in, are uh, equivalent to, um, um, actually all of them are equivalent to this Rothhaus function. But well, one representative in that class is homogeneous. I probably should mention this because, uh, again, uh, time uh, constraints. We have no example, not a single one, not for a homogeneous bent function of degree 4 and beyond. People have exhausted n is equal to 8. Not a chance for n is equal to 10. But we found no example of a bent Boolean function that is homogeneous at degree 4. I mean, it's ridiculous that we can't find one, but we can't. Anyway, they proved some result on the homogeneous, again, cubic. I know that I say homogeneous band functions, but actually all of them are cubic band. And it's a simple inductive procedure. Um, not uh, Zephyr actually is uh, the person who sort of uh, uh, spearheaded um, crypto in Australia. So Jennifer Zephyr is, is the main person there. She's you know, getting a little older, but uh, she still does a little bit of work. Um, and of course, most of these things are, um, most of these results refer to bounds or our hope of finding a homogeneous in some dimension. So maybe you can find for n is equal to 10, but maybe if you increase to n is equal to 50, maybe you'll be able to find a 40 point or a 20 point. Uh, well, good luck in actually covering that range, but uh, I don't think you can. So there is a way to sort of visualize um, these, um, these um, yeah, I mentioned the uh, homogeneous band function of the UK. There is a way to actually define the Nagy graph. So here's the Nagy graph. Again, homogeneous in mind. I'm taking all the k-tuples. I'm actually looking now at the algebraic of form. Every monomial has the same degree. The k-tuple immediately, right? Um, it doesn't matter the order in the product, right? It's a billion feature. So I'm taking out all the k-tuples. That's my set of vertices. Two such vertices have an edge between them, if and only if the k-tuple actually overlaps in a single index. That's an Aggie graph. Actually, it was invented in 1972 in graph theory. Um, it was, it, it was you know, used here uh, in 2000 something. Okay. So that's the Nagy graph. Of course, um, you have the classical notions in, um, in uh, common notorious. I probably should have skipped some simple notions, but um, a click, maximum, min, maximal, and maximum click. And the click number, of course, this is empty complete. So there is no way you can actually de detect this for general, um, general uh, uh, graphs. But my question is, is it possible to leave for these Nagy graphs? Maybe there is some theory underlying, underlying theory that can actually help you to detecting the maximum place. Why do I need them? Oh, here's an example. But that's here's the reason why it's hard. This is gamma six three. In other words, I'm taking six variables and I'm taking homogeneous functions of degree three, cubic. This is again done by hand. And if you increase it, you see the the artifacts here. These all come in the same vertex. So I, I couldn't do better than that. Anyway, so this is the next graph, gamma six three. Here's what's interesting about it, and, and uh, you'll have to take my word for it. For instance, this is a, uh, a maximum maximum click in that particular. But this is one of them. If you look at one to three, one to three and two, four, five overlap in two. There is an edge between them, and so on and so forth. So a, a click basically is a complete subgraph in the graph. Okay. Here's the main result, and right after that, I'm going to stop. The 30 homogeneous bent functions listed by uh, Q, Zebra, and Peptic are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the complement of the maximum clicks in gamma 6.3. This is ridiculous. I mean, it's such a beautiful result. Basically, look at the maximum click, remove those, and then just basically look at all the other vertices and list the monomials having those as indices. And that's a Venn function. And there are only 30 of them, 30 maximum clicks. And there is one form correspondence. Gorgeous result. Gorgeous result. Of course, um, it is unknown. Is it possible to find all the clicks in, in, in any, in any, uh, in any uh, such uh, Nagy graph? I don't know. I really don't know if it's possible. I have a student that's looking, trying to implement all these things. Uh, but think about it. 
gamma 10 4 has 210 vertices. Gamma 12 5 has 792 vertices. This really takes a little while to implement that and look through all that and extract the maximum complex, take the complement and check for pandas. If it is, of course, then you, you go ahead and, and try to come up with a theoretical result. Even computation will be great if you can come up with it. Um, and of course, you can modify the Nagy graph to construct, um, 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 to allow edges between overlaps not only by one, by two. Nobody actually, this is the first time that I'm proposing this. Uh, that I'm proposing this uh, investigation. <coughs> what about if I modify the next graph and I, I take a, a graph where the overlap is two, not one? A picture from my office. <laughs>